Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the WellBe Show and Podcast. I am thrilled to have Dr. Jay Goodbinder, a board-certified chiropractic internist and epigenetics expert with me today. Jay, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm pumped. It's be a great awesome. day. Well, I think we're going to have a fascinating conversation. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while because I love the concept of epigenetics, but I know that it's complex as the whole field of genetics is. Um, so I wanted someone to break it down for me and for my community so that we can really understand it in layman's terms and understand the research behind it. Because I think there are a lot of myths and misconceptions about how much of your health destiny is determined by your genes. And it would be great to get a little clarity on that. So First of all, as I said, you're a board certified chiropractic internist. What exactly does that mean? And how did you end up specializing in epigenetics? And then also, can you explain about, you know, a little bit about what epigenetics actually is? All right. Well, that's a whole lot, but let's do this. I've got it. <laughs> well, I guess we'll start. I'm 22, 23 years old. I'm chronically ill. I can't use my hands. I got big basketballs for hands, scabs and scales all over my skin. I have psoriatic arthritis, literally disabled super trust, don't want to live anymore. It's an awful situation. I've got a pain doctor who's giving me cortisone injections every other month when apparently the cortisone injections should be done no more than three times a year. I'm getting them every other month. And I say to doctor, hey, why is this happening and how can I fix it? Like, how can I fix my hands? I don't want this. Thing. I'm sorry you're unlucky, it's genetic. You'll just have to learn to live with it. But there's new treatments, new drugs coming out all the time. I got this new one called Enbrel for you. And Enbrel's got some, it's a biologic drug. It inhibits certain parts of your immune system, certain parts of your cytokine cascade. And uh, I bought it and insurance didn't pay for it at the time. And it was like $1,000 a month at the time to, to do it. But I'm like, hey, I don't want my hands to be swollen. And I look so gross right now with all these scabs all over my skin, I want to be done. Um, and it was like a, a third of people get lymphoma and a third get leukemia and uh, people get kidney failure. And I'm like, great, I'll have cancer, but my hand won't be swollen anymore. And it just sat in my refrigerator for two years and I never used it. So I, I looked into becoming a doctor of some sort. I looked into medicine. I looked into naturopathic medicine. I looked into chiropractic and I'd never been to a chiropractor before. So I read everything and I'm like, you know, with the medicine thing, I don't want to find out that drugs are the only way I can get better. I don't want to find that truth. And I think finally, I think you find truth and wherever you go, you, try, you find some truth and then you go that direction. I didn't want to find out that I needed drugs to fix me. And I look at a naturopathic and I go, well, I don't want to find out I just need like an herb to fix me or a supplement to fix me. The chiropractic model was, you know, give the body what it needs and it will heal itself. And I love that. Love that. And so I go to chiropractic school and after about a year and a half, I find out, well, we're not going to learn natural medicine. We're not going to learn how to actually fix things that way. You adjust. And if there's a problem, you refer out. I'm like, I've wasted my entire life. You know, I just jumped in without doing it. I'm like, my entire life is over. Well, I spent literally my four years in chiropractic school after, you know, my undergraduate, all I did was study on how to fix myself. Literally, I got into the cytokine cascade and these are big words. Are you familiar with cytokines? I am, but would you mind just explaining it for anybody else who doesn't? So part of your immune system that is really targeted by a lot of these biologic drugs and by pharmaceutical companies to try to decrease autoimmune disease are called cytokines. And there's different parts of them. There are cytokines that are inflammatory and cytokines that are anti-inflammatory. A couple of ones, if you've heard of Enbrel or Humira, Enbrel attacks something called tumor necrosing factor alpha and, and Humira attacks something called interleukin 12. These are really big words, but really they're just pro-inflammatory parts of your immune system. The way I found out how to fix myself, um, which I did graduate valedictorian of my doctoral class and then went on to become a chiropractic internist for another three years of study, all in functional medicine, um, was I looked at what their drugs were doing and I said, there has to be a natural way in the body. Your body has to be able to control those chemicals naturally. Why are those chemicals going up and up and up? So I did a ton of research on that. And I said, look, if I can push this other anti-inflammatory thing in the body called interleukin 10, it will control interleukin 12 and tumor repressing factor naturally. So then I just kept, you know, going through the body systems going, okay, so how do I raise that up and why would this be down? And I just basically got all my answers. When I did all my testing, I go, oh, well, there they are. Boom, 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 fix those. And I was on six medications at 23. I'm on no medications anymore. But that, that was a long thing from the cytokines, which are just inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory things. 
Yeah, I think people may have heard of cytokines when COVID was first uh, discussed yeah. because a lot of people were having these cytokine storms that were actually killing them, not the COVID. There was so much confusion about what that was and why that was happening. So, you know, it's very relevant today. Well, and you see that, like exactly what you said, the vast majority, now it doesn't mean there's some people who, who were younger, who were healthy and all that may have died of COVID potentially, but what you just said was a mouthful. It's like the cytokine storm. It's an inflammatory issue. Are you eating McDonald's three times a day? Are you diabetic? Do you have heart disease? Have you not worked out in six years? Are you morbidly obese? Are you sedentary? you get more inflammation when you do those things. And so you're more likely to respond inappropriately to an infection. Got it, that makes perfect sense. Okay, so a chiropractic internist, as I understand it, is somebody who went to chiropractic school but then did additional sort of internal medicine study after that. Yeah. And then how did you end up specializing in epigenetics and what is epigenetics exactly? Epigenetics was the natural progression for me because I wasn't interested in being a natural medicine doctor. Like chiropractic internist is a great thing because they go through all the chemistry for three years. All you're doing is going through chemistry and physiology and what this lab means and what that lab means. And if you push this, what this changes in the body back and forth, it's really great. Other than teaching you like healthy dieting and things like that, they don't really teach you how to fix things. They say, well, this nutrient can do this, this nutrient can do this. But it almost lends itself a little to the natural medicine side, which is like you give this herb and you can help that. Epigenetics more was the expression of disease. You're in a room. All the walls are covered with circuit breakers everywhere, these tiny billions of circuit breakers everywhere. When you're born, there's a handful of circuit breakers that are popped. You have these circuits that go into the room, their diet, their hormones, their uh, toxins, in the, it, toxins, their deficiencies, there's um, organ dysfunctions, like whatever, bad, you know, bad stress management, you don't drink enough water, whatever. So all these things are another... Uh, circuit into the room. At some point in time, when enough of those go wrong, you have more circuits pop. And those are genes. And a histone, if you think of a histone like a, a, a spool of thread, and it has all this data on it as it's wrapped up around this spool. You can't read it. It's not like a, you know, a book where you can sit there and just read through it. It's all wrapped up. But as you get under more and more stressors, and that can be emotional stress too, not just physiologic biochemical, that's going to open up and all of a sudden your body can read it and it says, rheumatoid arthritis. It says thyroid disease, not literally, but you know what I'm saying. And then your body starts to shut down your thyroid. Your body starts to swell up your joints. And something that is in your DNA, you know, I ask people all the time, I'm like, all right, so do you have, I look at a couple of different factors, you know, like, hey, you're not sleeping well, you don't have a lot of energy, your short-term memory is decreasing, and you're diabetic. You have Alzheimer's in your family? And they say, yes, well, okay, so we have to start working on these factors because the first few symptoms that you get with Alzheimer's are sleep-wake cycle issues and short-term memory. We want to make sure you don't go there. You have it in your family. We need to take precautions to make sure you're elite in your eating and change the way things are affecting you so that you don't get that. If you don't have Alzheimer's in your family, chances are you're not going to get it. But with those symptoms, you're damaging the hippocampus of your brain, which is the first spot to degenerate with Alzheimer's. So you're probably not going to get that disease, but you are damaging that part of your brain. So we need to figure out why you're damaging it. Okay, got it. So that's the concept of epigenetics. Right. And so how did you get into this though? Because again, it's, I mean, as far as I understand it, not that related to, you know, chiropractic work, so. Right. Um, you'd be surprised actually in chiropractic school, they talk a lot about epigenetics and making sure the body's moving appropriately and doing in, in maintaining proper nervous system activity so, so that you don't express disease. They're really talking at a very macro level about what epigenetics is. Like give the body what it needs and disease goes away. You know, they really talk like that. It's the natural progression in the minds of chiropractors. They may not apply it the way I do, but that's a thought. So I found a process out of Indiana where they say it's a year program on the study of epigenetics, the study of what humans throughout history did and their disease processes and the percentage of people that got certain diseases. When humans had clean air, clean water, they moved consistently and ate a human specific diet, you know, no processed foods, uh, basically meat, vegetables, occasional fruits, 
um, some nuts, some seeds they find in this, the hunter gatherer type of diet. And they were relatively free of all chronic disease. And actually when you adjust for uh, childhood mortality, they actually had one more year of healthy life than we do now. Now they had all these diseases as kids and they would die, they didn't handle things right and kids would die. And then they go, oh, well they only lived till they were 40 years old. How are they gonna get diseases? That's not true. What's true is a bunch of the kids died and that altered their life expectancy to be much lower. But once they got past that age, they lived a normal life and actually one year longer than we do now. Yeah, I think I've heard that before, that makes sense. So can you share the latest statistics as far as to what extent our genes dictate our future health outcomes and specifically our disease risk? Because like I said, there are a lot of myths out there related to how much your genes and a family history of certain conditions really play a role. Let's use autoimmune condition because you've had one and I think a lot of people in the well-being community are familiar with that or have one themselves. Okay. I think people mix genetic with congenital abnormalities. Congenital abnormalities is something you're born with. It's something that's hardwired into your data that you're going to express. Most autoimmune diseases don't come on until you're somewhere between 15 and 35, somewhere in there. There's some people who get them young. I've heard of kids, I've had patients here, children who had you know, severe eczema all over their skin. It's actually amazing. Uh, I brought that up. Some parents just sent me a before and after of their uh, five-year-old who had severe eczema all over their face and body up and through her hair. So she'd lost all of her hair. And they just sent me before and after. She's totally perfect now. And all we did was find out why she had it. Well, we did a bunch of testing. I did literally the most in-depth genetic testing that exists. We did like 90 pages of line by line data. And I personally break them all down. It takes me a couple hours to get through it and then create a genetic picture. And then we can, we can actually change the way she's expressing genes. I mean, I have a number for cancer, which is uh, at a Harvard, which is five to 10% are actually genetic driven cancers. Everything else is lifestyle. I've heard that statistic as well. And I wanted to ask you if that is across all chronic diseases or just cancer. I think if you're still breathing, we have an opportunity to fix you. Okay, you mentioned testing, genetic testing. Can you explain the differences between genetic testing that you might do in your practice and say 23andMe? Yeah, so um, 23andMe, uh, and I don't mean to disregard testing of any sort. I think 23andMe is probably really fun for uh, heritage and things like that. Um, and I used to run 23andMe you know, five, six, seven years ago when I thought that was so neat because I, I got a platform that was able to break that down. And then it came out, they're using this very, very inexpensive way to break down genetics, and they may be as effective as like 40% accurate. So it's like less than a flip of a coin. You could flip a coin and just guess what your gene is, and you got a better chance than 23andMe. The, the genetic testing we use, they have three different forms of verification as they go through this, uh, the, whatever staining method they use. With that being said, the accuracy is upwards of 95% on what they're pulling. So it's very specific. There's no, it's not a heritage test. It's not an ancestry test. It's specific to uh, pathways in the body and how you potentially can utilize or underutilize different methylation pathways. Uh, I say potentially because just because someone has a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism, so just because someone has a SNP saying, oh, I have, I have MTHFR, that's uh, people come in all the time. I have MTHFR, so I'm gonna be more depressed and I am gonna have heart disease and I'm gonna have that. I can't clean my liver because I have MTHFR. Like, no, that's not exactly true. And so we do actually other tests to see if you're expressing genes versus just have the gene. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the MTHFR gene because it's very, I don't know, popular right now to talk about it and everybody thinks they have it. And um, I had to explain to somebody that, you know, there's, double mutations and, you know, heterozygous mutations. So it's kind of a red, yellow, green system. Um, yeah, yeah. It's not just red and green. And right. so this can really affect you or not affect you at all. And even if it does, like you said, there's a lot you can do. So would you just give a little bit of background on that, Gene? So MTHFR, it means the methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. It's an enzymatic genetic mutation. It's an enzyme that converts your folinic acid into your methyl tetrahydrofolate. That is the active version of folic acid. Folic acid typically doesn't actually exist 
It's a crystallized synthetic version made in a laboratory that then has to get converted to folate and then, you know, folinic acid. And then there's multiple conversions in there. And then MTHFR is a very specific enzyme that allows you to convert from there to the active form 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Now, a lot of doctors out there, and you know, and I was, a, I was one of these people. I was one of the offenders eight years ago. And I'd be like, oh, well, you have MTHFR. I need to give you high doses of methylfolate. Let me give you five mill milligrams of methylfolate. You need this. Well, it turns out MTHFR is like a gateway into the playground. It is a genetic variant, and you have MTHFR, MTRR, MTR. You have all of your BHMT and CBS and a lot of genetic SNPs that could be there. Like, let's say someone has a COMT genetic variant, catecholamine O-methyltransferase plus plus genetic variant, which doesn't allow for the breakdown of dopamine. If you dump a whole bunch of methylfolate in the system because you've just looked at MTHFR, you're going to hypercharge and speed that whole methylation pathway along. And that dopamine is going to go higher and higher. And you're going to become more and more anxious. And you're going like, well, I had anxiety before, so I have to take this. And it's just getting worse and worse. I can't figure out why it's worse. Because you just dumped fire into a system that needed to be cooled down. You can't make any opinion just on one SNP. Now, with that being said, even with all that data, you still want to find out what you're expressing. Which metabolites are you creating? On a urine test, if you see ureth uracil or thiamine, it tells you that you need more folate activated into your cells. But if you have MTHFR and your uracil and thiamine are actually normal, you don't need to dump any more methylfolate in because it's going to create more issues. Does that make sense? Have you heard that before? I hadn't heard it explained that way, but it does make sense. Okay, so what sort of things turn on gene mutations or turn on these bad genes or these bad SNPs? And inversely, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious, but what are the things that turn off gene mutations? I know you spoke about this a little bit as far as your lifestyle. Um, yeah, so you basically have such a large amount of control over this. Now, there's environmental things you can talk about. Hey. You know, I wasn't breastfed for a year, so my microbiome was not, I don't have good roots for good bacteria. I'm going to have a bad balance, and I may have an overgrowth of, let's say, clostridia. High levels of clostridia in the body, we know, will create higher levels of dopamine. If you have a COMT++ genetic variant where you can't break down dopamine, you're going to have really high levels of dopamine. You're more likely to get schizophrenia and significant anxiety and OCD and depression and all sorts of things there. And... The breastfeeding you had for the first year of life is leaving you a terrain, a, a microbiome that has now allowed you to express that gene. You could be say, hey, I grew up in a house with leaky windows and water in the basement and leaky roof. And you go, hey, maybe you have a mold exposure. We do mold exposure. You go, oh, look at that. You're, you're rife with all sorts of molds that can damage your kidney function, damage your liver function, damage your brain, damage your immune system. And oh, now you're extremely permeable in your gut lining. You have increased intestinal permeability due to all that mold exposure or due to the clostridium infection. Now all these foods you're pushing through are creating this giant inflammatory cascade. All these inflammatory cascades, all these stressors on your body that we're talking about, just different things that can happen for environmental exposures are high stress on the body. And those high levels of stress, your body will try to survive. And that's when you start unrolling DNA in order to read it so that you can really protect yourself. Let's see the positive. Like I was talking about interleukin-12 and tumor necrosing factor alpha, which are these inflammatory parts of your body that the medical world is trying to put a biologic and just shut it down. Those things get increased when your gut is damaged, when your liver is damaged, when your adrenal system is down, those go up. When you fix your gut system, your liver system, and your adrenal system, interleukin-10 goes up and that blocks those like a biologic drug, except naturally where you don't end up with cancer. It just you have a normal functioning body. So your lifestyle directly affects things. And if you're eating things that are inflammatory all the time, that's a stress on your body. If you have infections, that's a stress on your body. If you have environmental exposures or heavy metals, those are all stressors on your body. If you're deficient in something, if you're toxic in something, those are all stressors. And as you get stressed, your body will try to survive. And so it'll do everything it can to let you know we got a problem. And letting you know we got a problem typically means autoimmune disease. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. All right. So you talked a little bit about it, but I wanted to circle back to it just because I know it relates so much to gene expression and its main functions of our 
genes and that's methylation. Can you explain simply <laughs> what that is? So people who have never thought about their genes before, other than I might have a you know genetic risk for cancer or I might have a genetic risk for Alzheimer's can understand what methylation is and why it's so important for our bodies. It's basically like a key that, that sits into a gene and allows you to express something or not express something. So when we say uh, plus plus on catecholamine o, o methyltransferase, that is a highly active gene that then slows down the breakdown of dopamine. So it creates its own issue. So sometimes something being methylated too much is a problem or being under methylated is a problem. But methylation is just the activation or inactivation of body processes and that's controlled by genes. So when we talk about methylation and your ability to methylate, we're talking about your ability or your, how efficient you are at making certain body processes work from a genetic basis. Now what's neat about those things is those natural chemicals, you can actually buy typically from a store and say, hey, if I'm really not convert, if I'm really not, don't just start taking supplements, it's a bad idea. I go to this, this enzyme and my chemical stops here and then it's really not converting. Typically we can pop that in right there and all of a sudden you create a pathway you've never had your entire life and go, listen, this is something that you are expressing now. Maybe we fix all these other things and you just start creating. I don't have to supplement that anymore. That's the goal. But if not, fine. You maybe take that the rest of your life, but it's not altering anything. It's just improving your efficiency at creating a certain chemical. And so you mentioned cancers. They, 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 I might have, I have the BRCA2. I have HER2. I have these things that the medical doctors look at and go, hey, you've got, a, you got your double BRCA. You got a 80% likelihood of getting breast cancer. Well, that's something to worry about. But in my world, then I would do just giant hormone testing. And so I look at the metabolic processes of how you break down your estrogens, whether it be 4-hydroxyesterone or 4-hydroxyestradiol or 16-alpha-hydroxyesterone, which are metabolic estrogens that break down and they're highly inflammatory proliferative estrogens that cause breast cancer, uterine fibroids, ovarian cysts, fibrocystic breast disease, endometriosis, all those type of things. And go, okay, so you have these, these, these uh, hormones that you're making, you have this bracket, you have her or whatever. These are genetic variants that predispose people to breast cancer. We can now inhibit and work to pull out these bad estrogens that are causing cancers. So you have a normal level like everyone else. And so you may have to keep up with that and be consistent and be like, all right, we just need to siphon that out. Whether we, we're using DIM or indol 3 carbonyl or we're using uh, uh, calcium deglucurate or we're using glutathione, we're using phase one and phase two liver metabolites to break that down. We can do that, retest to make sure it's gone and go, hey, you're not making proliferative estrogens anymore. Let's just keep doing that. And then you don't have to worry about having your breasts lopped off. That would be Those ideal. things that you mentioned, just if somebody's not familiar with what, you know, DIM and some of these other things are, those are all more or less supplements, right? Yeah, yeah, they're just natural supplements. They're, okay. Now you have to be careful though. So again, you have to know what you're doing. Talk to a real doctor to figure this out. But I want to make sure because there's so much stigma and misconceptions about what a real doctor is. So it doesn't necessarily mean a medical doctor. No. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, it probably doesn't mean conventionally trained doctor. But I think what you mean is go to a real health professional that knows something about this, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. We have a lot of medical doctor patients and it's very common for I sit down and I start going on, and I like talking chemical pathways. That's all I've done for the last 10 years. I talk chemical pathways. And it's very common. Like I had, a, I have a, a cardiothoracic surgeon who came in and we're working on something. And he's like, I don't understand anything you're telling me. He's like, if you just tell me to do it, I'll just do whatever. I believe, you know, I, I've heard other doctors talk about you. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And so he does all these things. It's very funny. Um, and he does real well. And he's on like three different cholesterol medications. I know... There was one bile salt inhibitor, one statin drug, and one something else, maybe two statin drugs. I don't know. This is a few years ago. And uh, he goes, I'm like, all right, so your cholesterol is now significantly too low. The American Heart Association says anything below 160 significantly increases your non-cardiovascular risk because your cholesterol makes up the majority of your brain, uh, cell membranes, and hormones. You need that. You can't just suppress it all the way down. His got down to like 88 total. And I was like, okay, this is really low, not safe. You need to 
talk to your doctor or talk to yourself. And I said it just like that and figure out what drug you want to come off with because you're way too low. And he's like, okay, so which one should I get off of? And I said, well, you know, this is your field. You know, you can, that's fine. So if you were going to get off one, which one would you get off of first? You know, and this kept, we kept playing because he has his job that he does. He's not versed in what I do. And so he's like, listen, I understand you're an expert in your field. Just tell me the pathways and why I would get off this. So we went through and I looked at the mechanism of everything and I go, okay, this would be the one that I would recommend. If you were going to get off one, this would be the one. And so we figured it out. Just because someone's a medical doctor doesn't mean they don't know anything. It typically means they're very good at pharmaceuticals and they're good at understanding the risks of certain things and how to save your life. Medical doctors are great at saving your life. If you came here and you're bleeding out, you've got a horrible car wreck, you're going to die at my clinic because I'm not going to save your life. That's what they do. Um, but they're really not great at making you super healthy the rest of your life either. That's not their goal. Their goal is to save your life. They're just different. They're totally different. If you're wanting to get healthy and feel better, you typically don't go to a medical doctor. Right. That's uh, my understanding as well. But I do want to go back to methylation because I know we were talking about that. So I think there's probably some people listening to this who are thinking, God, I've never really had my genes tested. I have no idea if I need to improve my body's methylation cycle. Can you do that? You know, how does one improve methylation? When we talk about methylation and activation and deactivation of things, and we're talking about using supplements, these are naturally, like when we talk about DIM, and we're talking about metabolizing through cytochrome 1B1, it's pathway in the liver, metabolizing these proliferative estrogens. We know that DIM fortifies phase one liver metabolism to pull through there. DIM is a supplement that exists in dark leafy greens. You want to improve your methylation, dark leafy greens are great. However, then you can get into other pathways where if you do dark leafy greens and you have a, a CBS cystathione beta synthase genetic variant or BHMT, uh, variant. If you have those and you start doing a bunch of greens, well, you may be putting too much sulfur in Brussels sprouts things with high sulfur. So there's a pathway called transulfuration. That's how you detoxify your liver and things like that. It ends up with glutathione. That's your body's major antioxidant system. You speed through transulfuration. Then because you're going so fast through it, you now are creating glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Now you have anxiety in a different way than dopamine would cause anxiety. You have glutamate, which is static. Everything's happening all the time. You can't figure out how to calm down. And you're like, I eat so much kale. I eat kale all the time. I drink kale juice. I eat kale popsicles. And I just have so much anxiety. It's supposed to help me. Maybe it's not right for you. And nothing's right for everybody. I've realized that over time. Nothing's right for everybody. I've seen it over and over. Like, We're doing everything right. Oh, maybe not for you. And so- It's also just a quantity issue, right? Because too much of anything, and especially too much of kale because of how it converts to estrogen and my understanding uh, can be problematic. I know my sister-in-law had that situation when kale was at its height of popularity. She was having it all the time. And I think she lost her period or something happened um, that was very unusual because she is in great health. Um, and it turned out it was related to the fact that she was just overdoing her kale intake. And once she kind of cut that out or just brought it down to a normal level, you know, things returned. So there's that component too, I know. I feel like what you just said, and I'm not here to, I, I don't know nothing about your sister. You just said your sister, right? I know it's my sister-in-law. But... Sister-in-law. I don't know anything. I'm just, this is me throwing something out there. There's huge problems when you have a phase one liver metabolizer, like a lot of kale with the dim in it, and your phase two does not work right it creates hyper-free radicals. It's 100 times worse than those proliferative estrogens. They become significantly worse when you go through phase one and, you, and you're like, I'm gonna, I gotta get rid of those, so I'm gonna do all this phase one dim, like this is what every doctor, all the natural doctors tell you. Well, let's use some dim and end all three carbonyl, that's what we'll do, except for if their phase two doesn't work, it makes it 10 times worse. It would knock out your period, it would make you infertile, it would cause all sorts of other problems. It causes autoimmune disease because it's highly inflammatory. Have Can you explain everyone. what you mean by your phase two doesn't work, and how could someone figure that out? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everything has to be tested. Um, you know, typically what I do when I see those type of, of uh, hormonal issues is I will use DIM and indole 3 carbonyl. I will use that, or calcium deglucurate, depending on what's going on in the gut tissue, if they're recycling too much bad estrogen, whatever. But what happens is about one more month, I take labs again, 
And if doing that shoots their liver enzymes up really fast, we have a phase two problem. So you can't use DIM on those people. Then you have to use something that's balanced to clean out the entire liver. And you have to kind of juice up glutathione, which is your body's major antioxidant, uh, major liver uh, detoxifier, because it's phase two as well. And so when you do a strong phase two, you can kind of suck from the bottom versus just pounding it and then pooling in the middle. Got it. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that stressors are things that can turn on bad genes. And there are many different stressors, um, eating inflammatory foods, being sedentary, uh, smoking, drinking too much, et cetera. Those are all different stressors. But do different stressors affect epigenetics differently or affect your genes differently? Are some stressors better or worse than others? For example, if somebody wanted to make changes to their genes, what are some of the most important uh, stressors to take out and inversely, you know, lifestyle alterations or lifestyle changes to introduce? The simple way to, to look at things is this. You eat human food, you have some faith in something, and you move. If you're sedentary, it's like the worst thing in the world. You want to get osteoarthritis? You know what? Over the age of 30, 40, 95% uh, of people just walking down the road have some kind of osteoarthritis, some kind of uh, disc degeneration disease, di joint degeneration disease. Now, only 5% of those have pain, but you can see the morphology change of inappropriately grown bones and things like that because people really don't move. And I love diet. I'm a big diet person. I talk about diet all day long and indulgent, over the top, anti-inflammatory foods. I mean, my anti-inflammatory Thanksgiving dinner, over the top. I like to eat. All those things are important. Moving is probably more important. Okay, so moving uh, or the lack of moving which is a major stressor you think is one of the most important. Obviously, you've also mentioned diet. We know that is hugely important too. Yes. Um, are there any others that you feel like have sort of a disproportionate impact on genes? My whole book is about overcoming fear because I believe fear is the opposite of, opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of love. Fear is the opposite of anything that you believe is a higher power. And anytime you allow fear to guide your decisions, you basically turn your back on any divine guidance. If you believe in a higher power of some sort, you believe that is love, the opposite of which is fear. So if you ever let fear guide a decision, you're turning your back on everything great. So right now, the more we spend time on our phones and all these lap laptops and all this stuff, looking at Facebook, watching the news, fear sells. Here's a dopamine hit. We have to step away and go, all this stuff sounds really terrible and I want to get involved. And I want to help these things, but everything's going to be okay. Nothing bad's going to happen. It's all going to work out. So the, I guess if we let fear or anxiety creep into our world, we're not moving. We don't eat right. Those are all big deals. Those are the three that I think are the biggest. Now there's a lot more though. Nice drinking water and cleaning out and getting the right testing to see what's actually happening. Super important, but those are the easiest. Yeah. And generally free. Yeah. Uh, correct. Correct. So when you run genetic testing on somebody who comes into your practice and you see a lot of issues, right? You see a lot of double mutations, a lot of problematic gene mutations. What are you doing next? Is it mostly, you know, you mentioned some supplements that you would use with somebody to correct some of those, but what, what do you generally, what's your protocol? Like what are the handful of things that you would do next to that person to try to get their genes or try to get their body in better shape because they've been dealing with and will be dealing with these uh, mutations? Um, so let me preface this by saying, unless it's a cancer patient, genetic testing until we're well into already working with the patient because I don't wanna treat SNPs. I don't wanna just treat genetics. I won't do it. It doesn't make sense. Now, if cancer patients were to a point where things are life-threatening and while they're going through chemo and not, I wanna find out why they got the cancer in the first place. And I go, okay, so you've already expressed something pretty intensely here. But what we do is we'll do a whole lot of testing to see what genes are expressing themselves. Um, we may run organic acid tests or the hormone tests, or we may, there's a lot of things we would run, Lyme's tests, even there's genetic predispositions to allow Lyme to go chronic or Epstein-Barr virus to go chronic, which we know can damage your thyroid or damage your, your liver, predispose you to nasopharyngeal carcinoma, Burkett's lymphoma, and Hodgkin's lymphoma as well. And so there's a genetic component that maybe your immune system doesn't work right unless everything's right in it. So, I mean, our first thing is after I get my testing done is we get everyone, we teach everyone. I have a holistic health educator here. 
and we actually go through a whole curriculum of something I've created to teach people how to live in a better way and make it as easy as possible and really alter things. We even teach better bad choices. So when you want to cheat, you can do the right thing and cheat. You know, don't blow out everything when you want to go hang out with your friends. With that being said, uh, once the genetic SNPs come back and I've already treated all these things and everything should be good and they're not, then I go, okay, these, these things seem to be not fixing. So, hey, you know, you have the, the CBS genetic variant where um, you're speeding through and creating too much uh, glutamate excitatory neurotransmitters. Okay, maybe we use some niacin to slow down methylation around there. Maybe use some L-theanine to calm you down a little bit. We can work on the physiologic uh, manifestation of these genetic variants. And so I would use some supplementation, things like that. But diet is always integral. Exercise is always integral. I mean, if you're having all this extra excitement, you know, in your brain, you can't calm down. Working out really intensely slows things down. Those endorphins are great at slowing those pathways down. And also, I think that we are an image of ourselves. Like, we create an image of ourselves. You, in your mind's eye, you see yourself a certain way. I just talked to someone yesterday. She was doing great, like severe depression. She got way better on all these things, was doing everything right, lost a bunch of weight, looked amazing. She had acne everywhere. All the acne went away. She looked perfect. And then I see her, I'm like, whoa, what, what happened? I didn't say that, but I was like, wow, okay. So you have changed quite a bit since the last time I talked to you. And she's like, well, I pulled my hamstring, so I haven't been able to work out. And then the, the COVID thing happened. And, uh, you know, I, I haven't been able to leave my house. And so, I, I, you know, I started off doing some better, bad choices. And then it just went to bad all the time. And I've kind of given up. And then she's crying. And she's like, I just don't think I can ever get better. You know, I, I did everything. I'm like, and you did. You're only like a month away from being perfect again, you know. You just have to flip back into the idea that you're a healthy person. The hamstring issue stopped her from working out because she couldn't run or do anything what she wanted to do. So as she's sitting sedentary, she started to visualize herself not as an elite athlete who eats elite and is healthy in every way and is succeeding in all levels. Now she's the couch potato. And you know what? I just need some pleasure from something, not from working out. I don't need pleasure from feeling good. What's my quick pleasure? I can get some ice cream. Let's get some ice cream. And then that becomes a habit. Everything's a habit, right? So today, you do the right thing whether you want to or not. Tomorrow, you do the right thing whether you want to or not. You make that agreement with yourself. And then over time, that's just who you are. That childlike voice inside of you is going, no, I want to get ice cream today. No, I don't want to work out today. It shuts up. Because like any kid who asks, I want birthday cake for breakfast. I want birthday cake for breakfast. And, you, and mom says, no. Mom says, no. And you keep doing that over and over. At some point, the kid stops asking. We all have that child inside of us. We have to be a parent to our child. The child is this body who constantly asks for things that it probably shouldn't have. And we want to feel that pleasure because our body is our conduit into this world. You know, we can see, we can taste, we can touch, we can hear, we can smell. It is our, our perceptive device into this world so we can see the truth. So we want it to feel good. We want to feel good because we are a symbiote. We feel good with our body. But... Uh, we have to make that agreement that we want what's best for our body. And maybe we have some fun sometimes in a, in a controlled board, you know, there's, there's appropriate boundaries, but when you let the boundaries go, the child will keep asking, it gets more difficult. And that's exactly what happens. People lose their way. I was just going to say, watching some of my friends and family members, parent, young children, you have to create an intense amount of discipline. Uh, in order for things to work correctly. Um, my friends and family that have really created that and just never ever give in, their kids are well-behaved and understand the rules and they appreciate the consistency and the routine. Yes. And then my friends who were too nice and just never kind of implemented that or didn't really have a lot of discipline in their own lives or whatever it was, or didn't need to be disciplined in the same way because it was innately built in somehow their kids are all monsters <laughs> yeah they're they're out of control i mean but that takes discipline for the parent too i mean the parent that's incredible amount of discipline because you have kids and you love them and you want to play with them and you're like i just want to play like okay let's just do whatever you want to do because it's fun and they're like a friend of yours like this is my best friend they're just like me but they're gonna do all the things that you wanted to do that you probably had enough self-restraint to stop yourself now they're going to be asking for those things and so it's hard to be a good parent it takes a lot of, you know, it takes a lot of confidence. It takes a lot of ability to want to work for it. 
And so I, I applaud all those people you just talked about, even the ones who, who, who've given in and made monsters of their kids, because their kids will probably have really close relationships with them. But I believe those kids probably will have less self-esteem because when you give boundaries, kids can assert themselves within that world and achieve and say, oh, look at that, I can do all these things. People who have no boundary, they don't have any look to say, this is achievement or that's achievement, it's just do whatever, not as good. Yeah, so I mean, if you use kids as an analogy for you know epigenetics, right? Turning on or off a monster. <laughs> I've noticed too that when you know a parent gives in and lets the kid watch TV, you know, on Saturdays, and then it's on Saturdays and Sundays, and then it's a half an hour before bed each weeknight too. Yep, and it just keeps increasing and increasing and increasing and the boundary slowly keeps pushing further and further out. And then when you realize what you've done and maybe that it's too much and you try to rein it back in, the monster explodes and it's very hard to uh, convince this child or convince yourself that you need to go from, you know, you had ice cream every single night after dinner to you're not having any ice cream, your body's going to react horribly. You're going to be so angry with yourself, miserable, all these things. Basically, you're throwing a, a temper tantrum with yourself, right? And so watching it's very interesting. You see human health and a human's ability to take care of themselves in this modern, very toxic world in the you know, embodiment of a child with discipline or without discipline, we all have it within us. We all have, as a child, we all have couch potatoes within us. We all have monsters within us, yeah. but how is it going to express itself or is it ever going to? And I think that's just a really cool analogy and way to think about it, especially because we're coming to the end of our time together. So if they're having trouble understanding methylation and all the different things that we've talked about today, I think that's a really good, simple way to think about um, what's going on with your health when you think about the role of genetics. I wanted to end on kind of an emotional note because I know that you wrote a book called Defending Your Life, Your Guide to Amazing Success and Incredible Health. You mentioned this a little bit before as far as fear, um, but you mentioned in the book, finding peace, happiness, hope, and promise. And it's really interesting because you're an epigenetics expert. You're not necessarily a spiritual guru or a mental health professional, but you really you know, decide to focus on that piece of it. So what do those things really have to do with epigenetics on a physiological level? Well, again, we talked about stressors, whether it's biochemical, physiologic, emotional, uh, spiritual even. You know, I was talking to myself in the book, it's a, you know, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I'd be great at everything. You know, just last week I, I made the decision. I'm like, it's okay that I'm flawed as a human being. Like it's, it's okay not to be perfect in every way. Like that's okay. Cause I think our, our mission to be perfect in every possible way leads to pretty harsh criticism of ourselves and others. That book to me was more about just accept you do your best and then be proud of whatever you've done. You can't be proud of yourself if you don't do your best. I mean, how can you? Yeah, I, I didn't put any effort into it. I'm really proud of what I did. Like, well, you can do so much more. Like, why would you do that? So I think you should always be proud of yourself with a caveat that you should always work as hard as you possibly can to be your best. And then you should, no matter what, should be proud of who you are and just know that everything's gonna work out. And that alleviates so much stress. And, you know, a lot of the times people are like, well, I can't get back to the gym. It's so hard, so hard to get back to the gym. It's because you have guilt that you haven't been there for a long time. Don't, don't be guilty, be proud of who you are and be proud of the fact that you had the thought to go back to the gym. So now, as the parent of this body, go back to the gym, finding peace, finding happiness, and you know, finding love, I mean, just feeling like loving, loving of yourself allows you to love others too. And uh, that leads to a warmth and kind of eradicates a lot of the fear that would be inside that anxiety that creates stress and messes with all the methylation in your body and gives you all sorts of chronic diseases. And so that's one way that you can very simply and free stop judging yourself. Yeah. Um, the more I've, you know, I've focused a lot on gut health for Welby and uh, in my own life and, you know, just simply understanding the physical nature of how stress impacts the gut lining and the connection, you know, the vagus nerve, which connects the brain and the gut and how, you know, the microbes and what's going on in your gut actually send messages to your brain to be happy, unhappy, fearful, whatever, and, and vice versa. It's so interesting. And 
you know, this idea of stress, people just think, oh, stress must mean they're talking about, you know, stress at work or stress in the media or something like that. No, just not liking yourself, just being mean to yourself with your thoughts all day. That's a chronic stress. Um, So you can have a very unstressful life on the outside, but if that self-love isn't there or that conversation with yourself is negative all day every day because we have you know thousands of thoughts uh, all day long I think it might be like hundreds of thousands actually then you're creating that chronic stress you're creating those problems in the gut you're clearly creating problems that may turn on bad gene mutations that you have Um, so it's a really a cascading effect I knew it had a lot to do with the gut but I didn't really understand the role of stress on our genes until you just, you know, talked about it today. So that makes a lot of sense why you focused on, you know, creating those positive emotions that would reduce this fear, reduce this fight or flight and reduce the stress that uh, affects our genes and our gut and, and obviously our immune systems as well. The last question I have for you is how do you hashtag get wealthy. So get wealthy is our website and all of our social channels and, you know, the whole platform. And I think it really is important for people to realize that health is not a passive endeavor. Um, You really have to work for good health, especially in this very toxic modern world where it's easy to sit all day and look at blue light all day and eat easy, fast food And it takes a lot of effort and work to do all these things that we know help us to live happy, long lives without chronic disease. And so I want to know, what are the things that you consider your kind of everyday health and wellness non-negotiables? It could be a couple of things. How I get well be is no matter what, I do work out every single day. And this is for me. That doesn't mean everyone has to do this, but I work out intensely uh, screaming, pushing weights as heavy as I can go, as many reps as I can go, taking myself beyond what I'm comfortable with. I want my workouts to be semi unpleasant at least. Um, so I know that I've accomplished something. I've worked through something. Also, I can't go a whole day without eating some vegetables. You know, if by the end of the day, I've, I've eaten all sorts of grass fed meat and had some fruit or something, and I've never had a vegetable. I need vegetables because I feel like, you know, all those other stuff is easy. Vegetables are the hardest thing to get people to eat. I need to do that. I get well be by doing the things that I know are good for me that are more difficult. I don't like to take the easy way because then I have nothing to be proud of. I was just talking about that with my husband last night, how the most challenging things in life are always the most rewarding and the most impactful and the whole idea of purpose and how people that don't really feel like they have anything they need to do or that they're responsible for, that they've really challenged themselves. It's very hard to feel intense joy or intense pride or intense fulfillment. You know, it's like you have to kind of go outside of your comfort zone to do the hard things to then feel those extreme positive things, which is such a funny, like, why would I go feel pain at the gym or feel, you know, fear and almost die climbing Everest. And yet sometimes we need to do those things in order to feel the intense joy that we're looking for. So it's a very interesting thing. And I get why you said that. Yeah. I mean, it's very clear that the things that you feel pleasure from that you don't have to work for are very fleeting. That pint of ice cream that as soon as you're done eating it, you go, can't believe I just did that. It was fun while I ate it. Can't believe it. And you feel bad at me the whole day. You, you, well, you know, I'm going to lay on my couch and watch TV all day. Ah, oh, this is nice. And as soon as you know, I'm like, I just wasted an entire day of my life. Go to the gym for an hour, work out like a crazy person, push yourself to the edge to a point where you almost feel like you can feel your mortality. And then you get to really respect your life for a very long period of time. So, I mean, that it's just a total different feel. Yeah, totally. So for somebody that is interested in doing some of the genetic testing that you do, or, you know, more interested in your work, where can people find you? And also, you know, do you see patients remotely, like from anywhere? Because we've got an audience, you know, that's everywhere. And or what should somebody do if they want to do some of this analysis or this testing, but don't know who to go to and just have, you know, like a conventional GP or something? Sure. Um, The conventional GP, typically not good. I mean, occasionally, yes, but typically not good. We've had people from 17 different countries flying to Kansas City to come to our clinic. Uh, We are known for the most in-depth testing anywhere in the world here. 
That's what we're known for. We also see people through Zoom. Our website is Dr. Goodbinder, drgoodbinder.com. Uh, you can go get on our website. You can find me on Facebook, uh, the Epigenetics Healing Center on Facebook. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of this today. I hope that people feel a little bit more comfortable thinking about their genes and the concept of epigenetics now after listening to this conversation and either want to explore some further genetic testing or just feel more strong in their convictions to do some of the things that you said affect your genes the most, like move and eat well and limit you know, stressors or stress itself uh, with positive emotions and self-love and all of that. So um, a lot of the things that we talked about today, which I love, are free. And a great way to know how you might be doing with your genes is also just paying attention to how you feel. So if you're not having any manifestations of chronic health issues and you're doing a lot of the things that we've talked about that will help keep you well, there's a chance that no matter what your genes are, you might be able to you know, never have them turn on as far as uh, bad gene mutation. So I feel really encouraged by kind of the free and easy nature of some of the basics, even though we know that if you are having some issues, it can get pretty complicated and having some thorough genetic testing like you do can be really helpful in understanding the why and the root cause. Um, Cause we know that's really the most important thing that the conventional healthcare system really isn't giving to people. All right. Awesome. Well, this has been great. And um, I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks again, Jay. Thank you.